We're trying something new. We're uploading this week's lunch gathering to YouTube. We hope that you'll enjoy it this way. If you would like to subscribe, there's a little red subscribe button down below and a little bell thing. And if you click on the bell thing, it will alert you to when new videos will be posted to the BDRnet channel. Let's see how it works. Thanks for listening. Well, I'm really pleased to have Paul Schulens with us today. Paul is uh, going to talk to us about the, uh, now you call them something other than drones. <laughs> S-U-A-S, Small un Unmanned Aircraft Systems. And that's a drone. <laughs> <laughs> the, the, the technical FAA name, right? But uh, as I say, we're, we're really pleased to have uh, Paul uh, Schulens with us from Boston and Massachusetts. And uh, we're going to talk about this matter of inspections using drones or small unassisted aerial alien. <laughs> I'll, get it. I'll, get, they are. I'll get it in my head sooner or later. And so, Paul, we're going to turn it over to you and uh, see what's going on. Thanks. Okay, great. Well, thanks, Barry. And thanks so much for uh, inviting me, guys. So happy to see a bunch of familiar faces. Grady, I haven't talked to you in a little while. And Mary, nice to, nice to see you on as well. I'm sure I'm missing some others. Um, but uh, happy to be here. This is kind of my first visit, so bear with me. I'm going to attempt to share my screen here and bring up the PowerPoint. Can we see that, guys? Yep. Perfect. Okay, great. So uh, anyway, um, yeah, what I'm going to do is uh, kind of go through the slide deck here and um, pause every once in a while. This is kind of new technology for broadcasters. Um, of course, infrared science has been around for a very long time, and I've been uh, recently learning a lot about it. Um, I took a course uh, very recently and got my level one um, thermography certification. There are three levels to that, and I plan to go for level two and level three because it's a whole science and it's very interesting to understand what infrared um, is all about and what you can and can't do with it. There are a lot of limitations that I wasn't aware of, um, especially with relation to broadcast applications. So um, I'm going to try and share as much of that as I can with you and see, um, you know, answer as many questions as I can. But um, it's been uh, it's been very useful in a, in a few uh, applications already, and I plan to try and offer this service around the country for folks that are trying to get um, uh, a thermal profile of their transmission system with rigid transmission lines for radio and TV as well as antenna systems. So um, without further ado, let's get started. Um, this uh, drone you see here. Um, SUAS is what we call them, or the FAA has designated them, um, is a uh, DJI Matrice uh, 210RTK, and I'll go through what all that means very shortly. Um, this is the um, aircraft that I use for um, tower inspections, both visual and infrared. And as you can see, it's got two payloads on it. The one on the left is a gyroscopically stabilized 30 times zoom uh, camera, which is great for visual inspections. And the one on the right is an X-T2 um, camera that um, is made by FLIR, but is made to also pair nicely with the aircraft, the DJI aircraft. And that has a, um, a 4K camera on it for visual um, and also a, uh, an infrared imager, which is um, what we're mostly going to be talking about today. And that camera is also gyroscopically stabilized. So let's talk a little about the history of infrared radiation. Um, this guy who uh, I've heard a lot about, William Herschel, uh, you may have heard of him. He, he was a famous astronomer, lived in uh, the late 1700s, early 1800s, and he um, is the one who really discovered uh, infrared uh, radiation, what it was all about. And it all started by using uh, a prism. And he took that prism and pointed it uh, at the sun and he saw a lot of different colors come out. And he noticed that those colors produce different temperature gradients. 
And he also noticed that the red, white, the red light was the warmest and the blue light was the coolest. And then he could even detect beyond the red light what he could see visually, there was an area there that was even hotter. He also discovered Uranus, the seventh planet from the sun in 1781. And um, he used a visual telescope to discover this planet, but he also was, um, you know, leading to the discovery of the spectrometer, which also um, uh, was able to break apart the light and tell astronomers a lot about the composition of different planets and stars. So infrared, of course, is classified as electromagnetic radi radiation that's longer than what we can see with the visual light. It's generally invisible to the human eye. Um, and the range of infrared is generally to cons be considered to be around 700 nanometers to one millimeter in wavelength. But there's no exact limit to what's visible to the eye as sensitivity drops off pretty smoothly at 700. So sources longer than 700 can sometimes be seen if that source is sufficiently bright, creating actually a danger to eyesight because we, you know, our eyes are, are um, uh, very sensitive to, to heating. One of the big things that I learned a lot about when I started to study infrared is about emissivity. And you might have heard of emissivity. It's a measure of how efficiently an object radiates heat. Um, so it really comes down to how well it, it tells the truth about its temperature. And this is really important, especially when you're looking at things like transmission lines, which have um, obviously a shiny surface if they're not too tarnished. So em emissivity values range from just zero to one. Um, and uh, a theoretical object called the black body that perfectly absorbs and radiates all energy is uh, got a value of one. And um, it, it has a, a, a great bearing on what you might actually measure with a instrument. Um, you might have used um, you know, an infrared camera in the past that has a readout of temperature. Well, you need to understand what the emiss emissivity value is of the object that you're looking at before you can actually get a uh, temperature reading that is any, you know, is meaningful. And many cameras have options where you can dial in the emissivity of the object that you're interested in, and then you can get a pretty direct readout of the exact uh, quantitative value of what that temperature is. So um, in general here, if the emissivity of the object is below 0 0.5, you're unlikely to get an accurate temperature measurement. In these cases, you may need to consider finding ways to increase the target's emissivity. And um, how do you do that? Well, high emissivity values um, like electric tape can be used to accurately measure the temperature of low emissivity services like shiny metal or transmission lines. So this is an example of a paint can um, that has a shiny surface. And you can see on the left-hand side, um, a visual image of that with a couple of pieces of tape on there. And on the right-hand side, you can see the same, the, the same paint can, but um, you can see where the tape is, that you're getting a much truer value of exactly what the temperature is because the black tape has been put on there. And that black tape has a very, um, very high emissivity value. So um, a good trick is if you're trying, if you're indoors anyway, and you're trying to measure the temperature of say a transmission line or an elbow complex, um, and it's a rigid line that's copper and it's shiny, a really good idea would be to put a piece of black tape, electrical tape on there and point the gun at that, um, at that uh, section. And you'll get a much truer reading than you would if you were looking at the shiny surface. And so I thought I would include um, some samples of what different emissivity values are for di different materials. And you can see um, the, the values here between copper that's polished and brand new is very, very low, um, or oxidized copper, which is um, 0 0.65. And then there are a number of different other samples that I decided to throw on this slide that show you the great variation in um, emissivity values for different um, different types of materials. So um, you can see that it's, if you're, if you're looking to measure 
absolute values, um, it's it's really important to do a little research and figure out exactly what your um, emissivity is of the material that you'll be looking at. Applications for SUAS and broadcast engineering. Okay, so there are two things we just kind of talked about. One was the quantitative measurement, which of course requires you to know the emissivity value. And then there's qualitative. Qualitative, um, using thermography skills and training to evaluate thermal images based on uh, what you're seeing in the, um, in the photograph. Um, such examples include solar panels, rooftops, and broadcast transmission lines and antennas. That's kind of where I've been heading with this project is in the qualitative um, end. The quantitative end, again, what we just talked about with needing to know the specific emissivity values um, is a numerical measurement reporting uh, calibrated, you know, with calibrated instruments in a controlled environment that may indicating uh, overheating and, you know, some examples of really um, important way, important applications to use quantitative measurements would be when you're looking at electric motors, um, maybe uh, electric panels, and of course, human subjects. Now with, uh, you know, what's been happening with COVID, um, you may have seen a lot of examples where, you know, you can't enter a room unless someone, you know, shoots your forehead with one of these infrared cameras. And of course, it's important not to look qualitatively at that, but quantitatively, you want to know if someone's running a fever. And of course, um, the quantitative measurements would be most appropriate for that. I'm going kind of quick here, so I will pause for a second and see if anybody has any questions before I go through some more slides. I was going to suggest having the emissivity for black um, polyethylene, which, which is the uh, outer of many uh, transmission lines. Yeah, um, you, you're talking about flex lines? Yes. Yeah, um, that's a good point. I, I do not know what that value is, and I've actually done no work with flex lines um, yet. So um, that's, a, that's a great point. Um, and I will see if I can research that, but I don't know what it is. I'm guessing that it's probably close to electric tape, but I don't know that. So that might be, that might be actually a, a pretty good example of where you could do quantitative measurements. So uh, some of these slides are from AFSI, uh, so uh, please forgive the uh, title at the top here. Um, when infrared energy strikes the detector, it heats it, changing the electrical resistance. This is how an infrared camera works. And these changes in the resistance are measured and processed into the digital signals, which end up creating a, um, an image, a digital photograph. Um, and if you're more interested in, um, in exactly how these infrared cameras work, well, the energy um, and the, the photons and the, uh, in, the electromagnetic radiation um, uh, strikes the vanadium oxide um, or amorphous silicon resistor and changes those values. And electronically, there are circuits in there that um, figure out where, um, you know, where that is and it forms a, a picture. Um, in many, many cases, um, many of these cameras um, will form radiometric JPEG images. These are JPEG images with um, metadata built in that actually stores the, uh, the temperature for each individual pixel. And that's a very valuable thing um, if you're doing these quantitative measurements because in post-processing using a free uh, program called FLIR tools, um, you can take the JPEG image and actually put the mouse cursor on any point in the image and get a, uh, get a reading of what the temperature is. And that of course assumes that you know the emissivity values and um, You've got other, other things um, well controlled in the environment, which I'll talk about in a later slide.
So the primary cases for uh, UAS or drone use in broadcast engineering, um, as, as I see it, are, are four. I kind of divided in my head into four um, usefulness uh, use cases for, for drones. Um, and I've been involved in all four of them, but, um, but mostly in the, um, in the thermal imaging area. So um, obviously visual tower inspections, um, especially with some of these um, higher zoom, higher resolution cameras where you don't have to get that close to the tower, but you can see things um, very clearly as far as, you know, um, even a cotter pin being missing from um, a guy wire anchor, or, you know, I've had some instances where I can even go up to the top beacon and clearly read the barcode right off the beacon label. So there are really cool things you can do with uh, the technology on these stabilized cameras these days for visual imaging. Um, infrared scans for heating, which is of course what I'm talking about here today mostly. Um, RF signal measurements, there are a number of companies out there now that have started to um, you know, make uh, antenna pattern uh, proof measurements with drones, both vertical and, and horizontal fields. Um, and in some cases, these can be done a lot less expensively and certainly more quickly than ground-based or helicopter-based measurements. Um, and then the other thing is um, thermal imaging of AC power panels. We all know about that. That kind of technology has been around for a long time. But, you know, one of the things that I'm starting to offer my clients is the ability to go in with a, with a gun and um, take the front panel off the circuit breakers and uh, or the fuse panels and, and take a look and see if anything is um, heating abnormally. So why are we doing all this? Why are we using infrared imaging? Well, we can, we can see all this stuff that's available to us, all this electromagnetic radiation that's not visible in a traditional photograph. This is like a sixth sense of what's occurring around us in our environment. Um, but you know, unless we have the proper detectors to look at it, um, we, we just ignore it because it's not visible to us. So by using these special tools, we can get a lot more information and uh, potentially save ourselves from some impending disasters, which um, we've already done. And I'll show you some of that stuff coming up. Um, so the application for infrared imaging um, is basically tower transmission lines. Um, and again, I've only used this with um, rigid copper transmission lines, anything from inch and five eighths up to uh, nine inch lines um, I've surveyed. Um, broadcast antennas, um, we can get right up into the aperture of the antenna and um, take a look at the uh, power dividers be behind the radomes and see that there is no abnormal heating. We can compare the uh, images and the heating patterns that we see to the blueprints from the antenna manufacturer and see if it all makes sense. Um, and so that can give broadcasters a lot of comfort that there's nothing um, deteriorating or going on inside the antenna that they wouldn't expect. Um, RF patch panels, of course, um, combiner modules, um, RF switches. RF switches are another thing that people seem to have trouble with, these motorized switches. Um, sometimes uh, the contacts aren't working great and uh, taking a look at those switches with a thermal imager on a regular basis can tell you whether anything's changing there. Um, and of course the electrical AC power panels that I've already talked about. So um, you've heard me use the phrase SUAS. Many of you have heard this before, but if somebody hasn't heard of it, it is uh, defined by the FAA as a small unmanned aircraft system. And that of course consists of the actual aircraft. The aircraft has got to weigh less than 55 pounds to fall into this category. And um, it includes the vehicle, um, the system on the ground connecting the operator to the vehicle and also the operator on the ground. So this is a total system that they're uh, talking about when you see the word SUAS, it means the aircraft, the radio connecting it, and the pilot that's um, manipulating the controls.
So what do they do? Well, they allow us to inspect areas on the broadcast tower that we can't really get to that easily. We found that in a lot of cases, it's safer, of course, and less expensive than a tower crew. We're not endangering anybody's lives by asking them to climb a tower in less than ideal conditions. Um, we can you know, fly um, in a wide range of weather conditions. It depends on the aircraft, but we found um, that some of these more modern aircraft like the uh, Matrice 200 that I am flying and the 300 that's a even newer model um, can fly in pretty um, adverse weather conditions that you may not think would be appropriate for a drone to fly in. For example, um, 30 to 40 mile an hour winds Usually not a, not a problem as long as it's not gusting beyond that. And um, in many cases, uh, rain is, is no problem for a drone. M many of these drones are completely waterproofed. Um, you don't wanna, you don't wanna fly in a drenching downpour, but if it's a uh, moderate or light rain um, or mist, um, that's generally not a problem. So these are weather conditions that maybe a um, a tower crew would not want to uh, not to not not want to work in, um, as well as the cold weather. You know, the cold weather does have some effect on the battery life, of course. But um, many climbers, when it's cold and windy, obviously wouldn't want to be on a tower. So, um, if you need to get some information on something you may think that's wrong with the tower, um, or either visually or thermally, um, the drone is a good option. Um, Many tower crews, you know, especially with the repack, have been um, really hard to get a hold of. So, um, if you try and hire a tower crew, sometimes it takes, uh, you know, several weeks or even longer to get someone there. Um, so the drone is easy to deploy on short notice. Um, I work with uh, a company that um, is uh, specializes in getting these waivers uh, pretty quickly for the airspace. Um, so if waivers are required, that's generally not a big problem for me anyway. Um, so we can, we can deploy these things quickly. Um, and then of course, there's the added ability to get views from above the tower while looking down, which would be a good trick if you're a tower climber, right? So um, I touched on uh, regulations and um, here are some of the things that the FAA wants to see. Before, um, before you go out and fly one of these things. Um, first of all, any drone activity that you're making money on and it's a business requires the FAA uh, Part 107 license. So um, in order to do that, you can go out and uh, take a course and take an FAA test. Um, there are a number of uh, different online courses you can take. You can go in person, um, but basically it's learning a lot about the rules and regulations of when you can fly, how you can fly and, um, and, and all that kind of stuff. And once you take that test and get your FAA Part 107 license, you're considered a um, SUAS pilot and you can operate the drone as a business to make money. Um, usually it requires a second person as a qualified operator. That's one of the things that um, the FAA requires is that you have the aircraft um, within a visual range all the time. And it's kind of hard to do that if you're looking down at the controls to fly the aircraft as well as acquire the data. You can't really be looking up at the same time to make sure that the, um, the aircraft is within your line of sight. So um, in all cases, I use a second person as a qualified spotter who um, whose job is to just uh, make sure that they've got a visual on the aircraft 100% of the time. Um, and most often it requires some FAA and local, sometimes even local approvals to fly above 400 feet above the, the ground. In many cases, um, I've been flying some uh, TV towers, which are always, always above 400 feet. Um, no problem to go 1,500, 2,000 feet if you have the appropriate waiver. And of course, you know, you've got a substantial investment in the, uh, at the equipment. So um, you want hull insurance for the aircraft as well as liability insurance, of course, if something were to happen and you were to do some property or damage to, um, you know, or hit somebody, God forbid, um, you need to be covered for that. So there's a whole 
slew of things that go along with um, the idea about operating one of these um, one of these aircraft. Um, again, uh, I'll pause again at the uh, at the end for questions, but right now I think I'll stop for a second and see if anybody has any questions. I do have a question, Paul. Go ahead. Uh, this is Mark. I'm I'm located out here in Columbus, Nebraska, at a tower site. Um, I, I've got to ask the question. And everybody else is probably going to ask: Have you ever ever clipped a guy wire with the drone? <laughs> Not yet, but it's but oh, it's early. Give oh, you'll time. love it when you do. Believe me. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No. Um, well, that's that's a good question. Thanks for that question, by the way. Um, so one of the things that I do very carefully, of course, depending upon the design of the tower, is to plan the route of flight. And generally, if it's a triangle face tower, um, you know, if the guy wires are on the face, I'll fly, um, you know, up, uh, you know, up the corners. And if they're on the corner, corners, I'll fly up the face. Um, and generally, um, it's a, if it's a triangular um, lattice, um, I'll make three flights, one up each, um, each face of the tower um, to try and get different perspectives of the transmission lines. And I'm talking mostly about thermal here, but, but it also applies to visual. When you're, when you're imaging the thermal, it's, um, it's important to be able to get different perspectives so that you can tell if you've got a weird reflection or whether this is really an abnormal heating that you're seeing there. Um, but of course, doing all that planning allows you to um, better avoid the, the guy wires and you know exactly where you're going to um, fly. Um, and because of the um, advanced electronics on the drone and what I'm going to talk about in a few minutes, the RTK abilities of the drone, um, the positioning is very accurate and you're not likely to drift very much so you can you can avoid obstacles like um, antennas and, and in particular the guy wires. Question came up, Paul, about uh, high RF fields and how much effect they might have on the drone. But it also would be a balance, wouldn't it, by the fact that you could run that drone uh, and you wouldn't have to reduce everybody's power. Yeah, exactly. Um, well, that's one of the advantages that I didn't mention is that, um, you know, with a tower crew, of course, you've got to, in most cases, unless they're wearing a suit or something like that, reduce the power. In, in the case of using infrared imaging and a drone, um, you don't want to reduce the power because you want to see if there's anything wrong up there. So you want everybody operating as normally as, as possible. Um, and that's one of the advantages of, of using uh, an aircraft is that you, you're not endangering any human lives with RFR. You don't have to inconvenience the radio or TV stations by asking them to reduce power. Um, and, um, and furthermore, um, the, um, the RF uh, interference to the, to the drone itself is something that, that I want to address. Um, and yes, um, you're, you're flying in some cases in apertures in the hundreds of kilowatts or even megawatts, depending upon the gain of the antenna. So it's a natural question to ask, well, doesn't this blow out the drone, you know, when you're, <laughs> when you're operating that close to the antenna? And uh, the answer is, not yet. <laughs> um, I do use um, uh, a hardened um, drone that um, has been modified by DJI to withstand um, high RF. And I'm going to talk about a little, a little about RTK technology in a, an upcoming slide, which also um, allows you to fly in these environments without danger of losing control of the drone or, or burning out any electronics. Um, it's, still a, it's still a major concern, of course, and um, it all depends on the focal length of the lens you're using and how close you need to get to that RF source to get meaningful information. In many cases, I can be uh, 15 meters uh, or 10 meters off the antenna um, and, and still get the adequate resolution so that I can tell what's going on with the antenna. I don't want to fly right up against the antenna, obviously. Um, as we know that you know the the, the fields uh, increase um, dramatically as you get closer by the square, so um, yeah, it's it's definitely a thing to think about. Um, and if you're going to use a drone, um, you may want to use a hardened drone 
and not a consumer type drone, especially in these higher RF fields. Well, Paul, do you a have a limitation on uh, being able to fly, or the, the limitations on 400 feet over above uh, average ground, uh, AGL, uh, is that waived if you have a uh, structure nearby like the tower itself? Do, can you fly 400 feet over the structure without any waivers, or do you still have to go through the uh, waiver process? Depends on the airspace. Um, that's a good question. Um, if you're close to a metropolitan area, chances are there are airports in the area with instrument approaches or controlled airspace that does require the waiver. If you're in what they call class G airspace, um, as defined by the FAA, you don't need any waivers and you can, you can, do, what, you can do whatever you want, basically. Um, so it all depends on exactly where you are going to be operating. Marvin, you were trying to get in. Oh, yeah, I just quickly wanted to ask Paul, um, what kind of an investment is involved in that uh, drone as you, as you showed at the beginning of the presentation there with the two cameras on it? Um, so it depends on the payload, uh, but with the two cameras on it and for this particular model, um, I believe my investment uh, just in the hardware without the training was in the thirty to $35,000 range. Yeah, that doesn't surprise me. Thank you. Yeah. Anything else before I continue? Maybe okay. at the end of your presentation, I'll come back and show you a little infrared camera that hooks up to my iPhone that uh, I did some work with inside a building. Oh, okay, great. Love to see it. Uh, okay. Um, so some of the flight conditions um, that uh, you know are important to, to think about, um, wind speeds have to be within tolerance. And we talked a little about that earlier. Um, this varies with the type of equipment that you're using and of course the skill of the pilot. Um, and of course it requires sealing and visibility clearances much like um, uh, regular pilots need for flying in visual conditions. Um, I have flown in um, somewhat foggy conditions, um, but I still needed to maintain visual contact with the drone. And that was um, made easier by strobes and position lights on the, um, on the aircraft. But, um, you know, the, I needed to get some data and uh, the conditions weren't great. I couldn't even get to the top of the tower, but I got to the area where I was concerned about and, um, and it worked. So, it's, uh, it's one of those things um, where you just have to be um, really careful and each case is a little bit different. Um, with regard to infrared imaging, it's ideal to fly at dusk or dawn to minimize the solar loading. And um, you know we're all familiar with signal to noise, but think about this, if you're flying on a sunny day and the sun is beating down on the tower at noontime and you're trying to get, um, you know, uh, very, very uh, accurate um, indications of whether there's a problem on the tower. All that solar loading is going to reduce our signal to noise ratio of what we're looking at on the transmission line or on the antenna. So the, you definitely want to not have the sun, you know, casting a shadow on the tower when you're doing this. I find it's, it's ideal to fly just after sunset when the sun's uh, about seven or eight degrees below the horizon. It's also possible to do this on an overcast, flat overcast day, um, but I, I do like to do it better um, just before sunrise or just after sunset. And uh, we already talked about the fact that the flight should ideally take place when all the stations are operational for thermal measurements. So um, RF interference cautions, use RTK technology to um, help stabilize the drone whenever possible. I'm going to talk about that coming up in a minute. Um, you want to fly as far away as from the radiating elements, of course, as possible, but still obtain useful resolution. You want to use an appropriate focal length lens for the infrared camera. Um, and of course, caution for guy wires and other obstacles. We talked about that and to never fly over people or animals. Um, the Focal length of the lens is something that's uh, really important. Many of these um, SUAS cameras 
come with fixed focal length lenses. In fact, I don't know of any of them that have changeable focal length lenses. So when you make this investment, um, you need to make a choice and you need to be happy with it um, for a long, long time. Uh, and there are basically four different focal length lenses, depending upon the application that you're going to be using it for. Um, you know, if you're taking pictures of a solar array um, and it's a wide, uh, a wide array you, you're trying to image, well, you need a shorter focal length lens for that. If you're doing what I'm doing and taking pictures of transmission lines that are very small um, in terms of their width on a tower, then you want a, a longer focal length lens. But that wouldn't work as well if I was trying to use that same lens for the solar array. So the, um, you know, the choice needs to be made when the investment's made in the camera. Um, and it somewhat limits what you can do for business with your investment. Um, so there's a, there's a whole strategy there to, uh, to figure out what kind of lens you want. So RTK, um, if you're not familiar with RTK, RTK is a positioning technique that um, advanced drones use. It's called real-time kinematic positioning. And um, what it does is it is like a position enhancement um, from GPS. Um, and you can see in the diagram here, the operator is using a remote control to control the drone. But you've got this other thing on the ground on the right-hand side here that's sitting on a tripod. It's a base station. And um, this thing has GPS as well. And what happens with the RTK is that it also gets satellite information as well as the drone getting satellite information. And it computes a correction factor that gets transmitted to the drone. And um, it also takes the magnetic compass that is in the drone and brings it onto the ground. And that's important, especially in this application because when we're dealing with high RF, the compass is pretty worthless. So having that magnetic compass on the ground and transmitting that real-time information to the drone helps it um, stabilize itself much, much better. In fact, accuracies with a good RTK base station can be in the several centimeter range, even with gusty winds. So um, even though the drone's gonna move around a little bit, the positioning um, that's reported um, and, and the fact that the drone knows exactly where it is, is good down to several centimeters, um, which is pretty amazing stuff. So um, I always use RTK. It's, um, it's part of the investment that, uh, that I made in equipment and we set that up on a tripod, uh, usually pretty close to the operator, but it just needs to be within line of sight of the drone and of course the satellite. So uh, the benefits, you pinpoint accuracy, less concern about the winds, brings the compass away, and you always know the exact position resulting in accurate ho hovering and position control, even in some gusty wind conditions. A little bit more, this is a, a little bit closer picture of the um, RTK um, base station. Um, this over here in the middle is the uh, battery pack and uh, this, this pole is collapsible and you know it all goes into a case for transport and this is the GPS uh, receiver and uh, radio transmitter that uh, communicates with the aircraft. So um, and Barry am I doing okay on time here? probably finish in about 15 minutes or so. Um, I just don't want to go too long. Are we, uh, are we okay? Yeah, we're okay so far. We're about 40 minutes in and everybody's still here pretty much. <laughs> good. That's good to know. Um, okay. So um, we're, we're operating in an uncontrolled environment with these drones. And one of the things that, um, that, that I learned pretty quickly was it's meaningless to specify precise temperatures in an uncontrolled uh, environment. Wind is our enemy, and it's by far the biggest variable in what these numbers are gonna come up as. As I, as I say here, a three mile an hour wind can cut the temperature reading in half. So basically, your numbers are worthless if you're um, trying to image on a tower. Um, you can't tell your client that your, your, your 
your antenna is at 72 degrees here and 68 degrees here. It just doesn't work because you don't know what the wind is at the moment that you're, you're measuring the temperatures. And I had thought, well, boy, I'll get clever and I'll put an anemometer on this thing. And, you know, and then there's prop wash that's going to affect that. And it just, it gets crazy. And then I thought, well, what's the real purpose of what I'm doing here? Am I trying to like tell them exactly what temperature it is? No, not really. I'm, what I'm trying to do is tell them if there's a problem. And that comes down to qualitative, um, you know, uh, examination of the images. And that's what I've concentrated on. So, um, you know, again, the value of this whole imaging thing on towers is to detect uneven or unexpected energy loss and not so much to tell them the exact value of the temperature that you're, you're seeing. Um, also, the angle of the image acquisition is critical and requires a, an angle greater than 60 degrees. Um, so if your angle of acquisition is less than 60 degrees, you're not gonna get an accurate uh, picture. You're gonna get reflections. And um, again, uh, emissivity comes into, into play here. Emissivity of different components will pr produce dramatically different thermal indications. We talked about emissivity earlier in this discussion, and I mostly related that to um, quantitative measurements. But um, of course, it relates also to qualitative measurements because if there is printing or a label or something like that on the transmission line, it's going to look like there's a thermal anomaly there when there's actually not. So it's important to understand where the labels are and to take some um, visual pictures as well as infrared pictures um, to understand if you're seeing an ano anomaly, whether it's due to um, you know, a piece of tape or a label on the transmission line or if there's really a hot spot there. The spot size ratio is the ratio of the distance between the camera and the target. And it's important to calculate that. I talked before about focal length of the lens and that's what this chart is showing. There are basically four different focal lengths that are offered with the types of cameras that, that I happen to be using. Uh, I am using the 19 millimeter, which is a pretty, um, pretty uh, telephoto, if you will. Um, so it, it gets pretty close up. And uh, you can see the different spot size ratios that are, um, are shown there. The spot side ratios are important because if you're measuring and looking at a lot of different areas besides just the area you're interested in, you're gonna get, you're gonna get average values. And again, as I keep saying, we're not really interested in the values anyway, we're really interested in examining the visual images to see if there's anything that looks suspicious. There's another view of the, um, the aircraft and the two payloads. You can operate it with both payloads at once you can operate it with one payload or the other. Um, the batteries, uh, you know, everything is redundant in terms of the electronics on this. The batteries, uh, there are dual batteries and uh, the flight time, you know, uh, average, averages with both payloads to be about 26 or 27 minutes. And generally I bring three or four sets of batteries um, with me that are fully charged so I can just change them out and, um, get all the work done in, in one fell swoop. Um, this, is, uh, this is that infrared camera, the X-T2. Um, the one I'm using, again, 19 millimeter lens. Um, you can see it's got a 4K RGB imaging camera on the left there and the, um, the 19 millimeter lens on the right is the infrared one. Um, this one captures at 30 frames per second. They, they do have um, imagers that they capture at nine frames per second. Those um, are a lot less expensive. I don't know why, but they are. Um, there's a dramatic price difference. Um, but one of the advantages of capturing at 30 frames per second is you can generate a sequence file, which is basically a movie that captures 30 frames per second as you're ascending up the tower and you get you get all that data and you can grab individual frames from that in post-processing. Um, radiometric images, like I discussed before, um, they assign a temperature value to each pixel in the image file. Um, and again, this is for controlled environments inside. And this is a circuit breaker panel that, uh, you know, um, you can see exactly what the spot temperatures are of different areas inside uh, inside the breaker box. Um, 
And, uh, you know, these radiometric images, like I say, have the metadata attached to the file so that you can go back and, and look at any of this stuff and manipulate it any way, any way you want. Um, natively, these images are black and white, but you can assign color palettes to them. And I think I've got a slide on that coming up to show some of the flexibility in the post-processing. The um, visual camera here is the Zenmuse Z30 camera. And you can see it's a pretty low resolution, 640 by 480, but the optical zoom is outstanding. It's uh, 30 times optical plus a six times digital zoom. So you can be a long way away from the tower and get some incredibly detailed images, um, despite the 640 by 480 resolution. Um, another, we all like to look at the hardware stuff. This is the um, Sendence controller that um, is offered with the DJI hardware. It comes with its own uh, batteries for both the display and the, um, and the controller itself. And it's a beautiful uh, sunlight readable touchscreen display that allows you to do all kinds of fancy stuff and zoom in and, you know, basically all the, uh, all the controls are, are you're touching it. Um, it's pretty intense to learn, but um, once you get the hang of it, um, it's really a, a pleasure to use. This is uh, an example of, uh, you know, my typical setup. Um, this is in Boston. Uh, and uh, this was at a, a TV tower there. I've got the, um, the base station, the RTK base station on the right set up. And there's my little helipad um, with the traffic cones um, telling everybody to stay away. Um, it is a dangerous uh, thing to, to fly a drone. So I take it very seriously. We use safety vests and hard hats. We have emergency phone numbers handy and a first aid kit. Um, in my earlier days when I was flying some of these um, uh, consumer type drones, I uh, you know, was catching the drone with my hand. And in one case, the prop hit my forehead and I was walking around NAB with a Band-Aid on my forehead, which was no fun. So uh, this, is even, uh, this is even more dangerous. So uh, we take the safety very, very seriously with this and um, take all the precautions that we need to. Um, this is an example of a picture I took of a cellular array at about 150 feet above the ground. You can see the, um, the, the thermal profile and the heating pretty clearly. Um, you can see the eight, eight inch energized transmission lines at the ice bridge at the base of the tower on this one. You can actually see in the background here, this is a telephone pole um, and there's the transformer on the telephone pole that's warmer than the pole itself. And uh, this, um, this particular one um, was, was a really good example. In fact, the best example I have so far of why I do this. Um, we had a situation at a uh, one tower site where we were getting uh, BSWR trips um, like on a monthly basis. It wasn't happening every day, but uh, they were transient and uh, then everything would come back and be fine for a while and it would happen again and again and again. And we looked at the thing with a spectrum analyzer and a TDR and, you know, we could see all the, bu the bullets and we could see the flanges and everything looked like it did the day it was installed. Um, so I flew this thing with the drone and look at this, look at this heating here. This was at about 900 feet above, above the ground. And um, you can see with the visual image, you know, you can't see, can't see anything wrong there. But with this infrared image, I thought, well, boy, that's interesting. Is that a reflection? I came back a couple of weeks later and did the same thing and saw the same, same thing right there. And um, uh, I knew exactly where it was, of course, because of the GPS positioning. Um, the owners of the tower decided, um, yeah, let's open it up. So they hired a tower crew. Um, I told them exactly where to go. They opened it up and look what they found. This O-ring here had dropped down and it wasn't installed properly and started, uh, started to do some, some damage here and some arcing. And this is one of those weird things where the O-ring just was not detectable by the TDR and stuff. And we were able to see that heating uh, going on. And um, they ended up replacing about 150 feet of hard line um, that 
you know, there was no indication that there was a problem from any of the electronic detection stuff that they were they were using. So I was um, I was really happy that we were able to help them out with that. Um, and this is this is the same um, example, but I wanted to illustrate how we can use um, different color palettes to identify um, these these problems in different ways. Um, there are no right or wrong choices for choosing different color palettes, but some uh, make the problem a little bit more obvious and you can see the gradients a little different. And all these color palettes are done um, in post-processing in a free program called FLIR Tools. So as long as you've got a radiometric image and some of these little cameras that uh, you know attach to your cell phones even, even have that kind of technology built in where I think you can download radiometric images, um, you can, you know, you can manipulate it afterwards and um, and see see these uh, different gradients. So the requirements are that the image has to be obviously in focus. That's really important. Um, these are fixed focus cameras, so that's not a major issue. It must be taken in the the, the the correct temperature range. You have to be close enough to the target to, um, you know, see the details that you're attempting to evaluate. And um, these three parameters can't be corrected in post-processing. So it's critical for these things to get right while you're acquiring the images in the first place. Some of the challenges to focusing properly are um, flying too high or flying too fast. If you're yawing aggressively or if you've got you know, electronic problems with the gimbal um, or flying in high humidity, all these things can um, degrade the focus. And once that happens, you can't really correct it. So you're gonna to have to fly the mission again if you don't have adequate um, sharpness in the image to tell um, if there's something going on. Um, so adjusting the span is another thing that's done in post-processing. You know, um, the image here um, in the center of the screen that's red with no stretch it's really hard to see what's going on. And that's kind of like the raw image that you get out of the, um, out of the drone. Um, and uh, by, by manipulating um, the software and stretching um, the visual um, part that you're looking at, you can get rid of some of the insignificant data like the sky and concentrate on exactly what you're interested in, which is the transmission line. So that's called, um, uh, stretching the image. And uh, these are done with sliders in the software. And as you can see on the right side, it makes, uh, it, makes it pretty obvious where the problem is, um, where the heating is here. And you can actually see some uh, heating in different spots down below as well. Um, this is an example of a picture of an antenna, a TV, UHF TV antenna, where we're able to see um, um, the heating behind the radomes. You have to look really carefully here, but there are some yellow areas um, which we can expand on. And um, you can see where the power dividers are and compare that with uh, what the manufacturer says you should be seeing to see if there's anything going on there. And this is an example of a handheld camera being used inside a building to take a look at a uh, transmission line. Um, here, you know, we can enter the emissivity values and get actual numbers um, for, for temperatures. And again, we talked about the, the best times to shoot, um, you know, after sunset, um, you want the sun to be four degrees below the horizon or no solar loading, or sometimes, like I said, during overcast days, you can get away with uh, shooting during the daytime as well. And then um, I wanted to show here at the, at the end here some of the um, RGB pictures, nothing to do with infrared here, but the optical zoom along with um, the gyroscopic stabilization allows you to really get some cool detailed pictures. And I especially like, you know, this one up here where you can zoom in and actually read the label on the, the, on the strobe light at the top of the tower, which is kind of cool. Um, this is one of the top guy levels here. You can see the cotter pin is clearly in place and there's no deterioration there. That's using that Z30 camera. 
and a couple of other pictures here too. This is a pole that's on top of a uh, 400 foot tower. This is where it attaches to the tower. And you can see, um, you know, th th this image here is a wider shot of this image here. And you can just see the amount of detail you can get with one of these um, Z30 cameras. It's, um, it's pretty impressive. Um, and then some other pictures here just of uh, elbow complexes and power dividers, um, you know, toward the top of uh, toward the top of a TV tower installation here in Boston. We caught the tower crew, you know, <laughs> using electric tape here. Um, and that's something that we never would have known unless uh, we had a close up view of it with the, with the drone. So we had them uh, go up and fix that. Um, infrared uh, scan here. Um, I think this is a movie that I can play. See if this works. Sometimes this doesn't work well with Zoom. Um, hopefully that's not too pixelated, but you can see the um, the smoothness at which the drone moves. And um, basically, um, when I'm doing this, I'm using um, I'm using the uh, sequence capture feature, so that um, I'm shooting a video basically at 30 frames per second. And as I said earlier, each of those um, frames is a radiometric image that can be analyzed later. And uh, I think right after this taper here, there's an FM antenna coming into view right here. And I think um, this may be the same video where we saw that um, that anomaly. Um, let's take a look right after this, right after we get above this FM antenna. Yeah, there it is right there. You can clearly see it. Um, this was the night that I that I did that imaging. So um, really, really shows up nicely there. Now, I'm going to try and see if I can get beyond this slide. I don't know why I can't do that. Ah, okay. So, uh, in conclusion, uh, drones can be used in many cases to perform visual and infrared imaging. Um, you do need the, the proper certification to get, get the job done. Uh, in a lot of cases, you need the airspace authorizations. Um, most importantly, looking at these images really requires an understanding of how the heat transfer occurs and how IR cameras detect the radiation. So that's why this um, taking a course and getting a certification is a really good idea because you can get fooled pretty easily. Uh, I know I was before I got any knowledge about this stuff. Um, and, um, you know, using the drones for intermediate um, visual inspections will enhance safety and lower the inspection costs. Um, so here's my email address. Um, I've got a new website called shulinsolutions.com. Uh, just put it on the other day. Um, and there's a, there's a bunch of stuff about that. Um, here are some resources as well. Um, if you're interested in getting some training on this, um, infraredinspection.com, uh, infraredtraining.com are a couple of companies that offer courses um, and certifications. Um, if you go to FLIR.com, you can get the free uh, FLIR tools software. And there's a ton of resources on YouTube.com from ITC. So if you go to YouTube and put in Infrared Training Center and FLIR, you'll see a lot of really cool stuff that, um, that's fascinating to watch. So um, I'd like to you know, thank uh, some of the people that have helped me put this presentation together. Um, my instructor, uh, William Schwann, um, from infrared training. Um, I bought the stuff down at Florida Drone Supply. They were great. Um, Jim Stenberg from American Tower has been very supportive as well as Gary and Cindy Cavell from Cavell Mertz. I think many of you know them. Uh, I work closely with Jim Leifer at American Tower. And uh, again, there's my, uh, my website and my telephone number. 
and I'd be happy to answer any questions. And I apologize for going a little over. So I'll, uh, I'll turn it back to you, Barry. Well, the question was raised about uh, taking uh, the uh, infrared and the standard pictures at the same time. You showed a camera. I think you said did both at once, or is it because you have two cameras that you do that? Yes, you can use um, both at once. I can't use the Z30 at the same time I'm imaging with the um, X-T2, but the X-T2 has a, a 4K visual camera in it, as well as infrared, and you can image simultaneously with those. So on one run up the tower, you can be doing two types of imaging, uh, which saves a lot of time. Okay. What is the typical distance that you use? You mentioned at one point 155 feet. Uh, do you generally try to keep the drone at that distance, or do you bring it in closer? Um, I bring it in closer. It depends on the power level and the type of um, the type of station that we're we're dealing with and the the, um, the ERPs of the stations. But generally, um, I try and get as close as I need to to get adequate resolution on the transmission line, which is usually in the 50 to 100 150 foot range, uh, depending upon the size of the transmission line and um, and of course the weather conditions and you know, how I'm feeling that day. If I'm feeling like I'm really sharp and I can get closer to the tower, I'll do it. If I'm, you know, not feeling great and I, um, I'm not gonna endanger anybody or any part of the tower, so I'll get a little further out um, and see if I can get the imaging that way. I'll toss one more and then we'll let anybody else uh, come onto the floor. And just wanna reemphasize, I think the point you made that any temperature reading outdoors is always a relative temperature. You are not able to give precise numbers, right? Well, I, would, I wouldn't say relative, I would say meaningless. Um, I think um, when, I'm, when I'm imaging... Um, no, I mean, um, when relative means one's, one is much hotter than another section, that's, that's as close as you can get. Yeah, but it's not even meaningful because the wind may be three, three miles an hour different, you know, three seconds later, depending upon where you're imaging. So um, it's pretty meaningless. Um, I thought it was going to be meaningful, but it isn't, uh, unless it's a perfectly calm day, <laughs> and that never happens. <laughs> okay. Anyone else have a question for Paul? I'd like to make a comment, uh, Barry. Please. Uh, I have a, uh, let's see, I don't see my own video on here because I got to want to show you this little camera. Okay. I'll, I'm going to uh, end this, this sharing for the moment and uh, go right ahead. Okay. So let's see if I can get this up here where you can see this. Yep. That is a, um, an infrared camera that plugs into the lightning connector on my iPhone. And it's made by Seek, S-E-E-K. And I just looked it up. I paid $164 for this yeah, little device. And it has, comes with a little uh, plastic carry case that it goes into to protect it. And so I carry it around with me a lot. And I'll show a picture here that... Um, down at KBLA, I took it down there and I was kind of curious about a power panel. And uh, this was a hot spot I spotted in the power panel. And this was a breaker that was feeding a uh, 208 volt three phase uh, uh, to an air conditioner. And this was running hot. And also the air conditioner had, a, I thought a premature compressor failure. So I talked to the electrician and we decided to rewire things and put in a transformer so that we gave the air conditioner 200 and yeah, 240 volts and uh, wired it on a separate uh, bigger uh, circuit breaker got this because it had this caused a fire in this particular panel it would have taken three stations off the no two stations off the air. So we rewired all that and got rid of this hot spot here. And I might also mention in my house here I do a lot of uh, I do solar heating to heat the house. And uh, I've got a FLIR um, one of those little temperature guns. And I also took a course that FLIR offered, offered uh, about emissivity and all these, some of these things that Paul has talked about. And I found that I learned through the course that uh, in my solar system, I've got copper piping, you know, it has typical uh, uh, oxidized copper piping, but to increase the emissivity to get a more accurate reading, I put a piece of electrical tape on there. So I've got uh, spots around the solar system here where I've got pieces of electrical tape to put a black surface there and that increases the emissivity to help get a better reading. And as part of the course, 
they illustrated an interesting thing. They took a, a tin can, half of the can was painted black, the other half was just the usual kind of silvery color of the tin can. And they put the hot water in it and then started measuring it with one of the FLIR, uh, well, I think we even had one that made pictures at the same time. It was interesting to see the difference in the black half of the can versus the, the painted black half versus the unpainted, how it, the black increased the emissivity. So it was an interesting course. And I thought people might be interested in this little Seek uh, camera that goes on a smart. I think they make it for iOS also. I, I bought the one for my iPhone, but I, I think they have it both ways. So that's a handy device for use around the radio station. And you don't need any FAA certification. Yeah, yeah. No, th those, th you know, that's, that's a great comment. Um, you know, th these, there's nothing wrong with these um, inexpensive uh, uh, cameras that can attach to your cell phone. They're, they're great. And, um, you know, as long as you know the limitations and how to use them, and it's great that you learned all, all about how to use them and how to interpret the images. Um, the main thing that you pay for when you buy um, a, an infrared camera is the resolution, the number of pixels. And it's not like a visual digital camera that you might go buy because it's so much more expensive to manufacture these um, infrared cameras. Um, so if you look at the actual resolution on your, uh, your cell phone camera, you'll find that it's surprisingly low, but it's surprisingly useful despite the fact that it's low. Um, you know, I, I mentioned the X-T2 camera that I'm using. Um, was 640 by 480, right? I mean, that's that's not high resolution in today's <laughs> terms, but it's a $15,000 camera. So it, it all depends on, um, you know, on the manufacturing costs. Um, but yeah, no, Marvin, that's that's great stuff. So that, that begs the, the question, uh, in terms of having some calibration materials with you, like a black body radiator and a thermal couple, so that you can actually um, simulate the amount of IR and, and, the, and the surface temperature and, and to make sure your instrument is, is properly measuring it. Also, I had a question about R RTK. How long does your RTK reference station have to be in place before it self-surveys accurately enough? I know a lot of our RTK systems in the past, basically the site was already surveyed and you basically just put the instrument exactly over the, the survey marks. My third question is, uh, you know, GPS, the vertical measurement is least accurate of, of, the, of the measurement field. And that I would think would be the most important measurement in terms of what you're doing to see so you get a correct, accurate height fix for your uh, drone. Yeah, um, so let me try and take those one at a time. Um, the, uh, um, the amount of time it takes to get a, a RTK fix, it varies um, depending upon the view of the sky but um, it's never quicker than five minutes. And sometimes it can take up to 20, 25 minutes um, until it, it gets its accurate fix. That's generally the first thing I do is unpack that, set up the tripod and let it start getting the, the, the GPS coordinates. Um, in terms of the vertical accuracy that you were talking about, um, that all is, is, is recorded. Um, it's the vertical accuracy with good RTK is there. So you know exactly what height it is. But um, what I really go by, and in the instance where you saw that heating, was uh, a, a visual reference on the tower. And that's why it's important to have the visual pictures too. So I said, oh, it's, you know, it's three um, flanges above the FM antenna is where I was seeing that heating, rather than say, oh, it's 173 feet above the ground or whatever it it, whatever it might be, because with a TDR, you can look at that, but of course it includes the horizontal run and stuff like that. So I find it much more um, meaningful to tell the client that uh, here's where it is and here's a visual picture of that. And let's count out the, um, the cross members together and then we can identify the spot. Ira, did I miss one thing on that? Um, did, did you have one other question? Um, I think you covered it. Okay. Um, I thought there I, were three I, there. But. Yeah, I thought there were three, three there also, and now I'm, I'm totally spacing on it. Uh, obviously, you're, to some extent, you might be dependent upon proper, accurate mapping of the tower to begin with, because then you, you, you can see where, for example, the um, mid-beacon was, and if you know the dimensions of each um, uh, cross-sectional uh, segment there, you know, um, 
which is typically the tower manufacturers give you, then you can actually just do a, a visual count. I have a tower situation where I actually, just a mile away from the tower, with a telephoto lens, I got a perfect, you know, bottom to top 400 foot um, image. And then you can basically, from, from a distance, actually count and, and measure where things are. And I found a lot of equipment that was not where they said it was. <laughs> so. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. And I think that's one of the great things you can do with a drone um, quickly is to go up and do visual surveys to find out uh, inventory, you know, do an inventory count and then figure out whose antenna is, is where. Um, it's a lot quicker sometimes than, um, than sending a guy up the tower. Although, you know, I have to say, you know, we're not trying to say here at all that drones are gonna ever replace tower climbers for inspections. You know, drones can't tighten bolts. D drones can't see all the things, feel all the things that a human can feel, but they certainly are less expensive and they're easy to send up more frequently. Hey, Paul, I've got a question for you uh, regarding yeah. your matrice. Yeah. Does your matrice have obstacle avoidance on it? It does. Yep. Okay. I, I don't trust my, my I don't trust it. <laughs> How well does that handle guy wires? It doesn't. Or, okay. It, it doesn't. Yeah, you can fly right into a guy wire. I've got a Phantom 4 Pro, and I know better than to push my luck with guy wires. <laughs> Uh, but I, I figured for the amount of money you've got invested in your system, I thought, well, maybe they've got obstacle avoidance. Um, how can I put this? They've got it improved to the nth degree where, oh, guy wires, no big deal. I'll avoid that too. But you're uh, telling me that it, it, it will not work. Yeah, I wish that was the case, Fred. Um, no, it won't. Um, it will work um, in a lattice tower. Um, and it won't fly into the tower, um, but I've never pushed my luck, obviously. Um, but guy wires are just too small um, and you, you can fly right into them. So it's, it's really important, especially like I was saying, when I fly, um, not at night, but after sunset, those guy wires become tougher to see. So you really have to kind of plan out what your ascent is gonna be. And then, you know, maybe you, you get up to the top of the tower and you wanna come down a different face of the tower. You've got to basically come out from the tower so you're not crossing through the guy wire and then come back in and go down. So it's it's very tricky. Um, you know, you, you, you really have to practice it a bit. Um, and that's why the visual spotter is just critical because, you know, you're trying to manipulate the drone and look at the data and, and you can't be looking up at the tower at the same time. So yeah, you well, need to, yeah. You were, in, in terms of what you showed us before, um, in uh, Needham Heights, I mean, you were, you were flying over um, Route 128 and all the, all the traffic, and so you have to be really careful that you don't have, cause an issue. Yeah, um, I was actually very close into the, uh, into the tower, so I was um, technically still above the property of the, um, you know, of the tower there. However, the other one there, I, um, Ira, um, was above the Sheraton Hotel. Um, and again, you know, you get, you, you gotta be careful there as well. Yep. Yep. So. Um, I was just, I, I was just looking at the chat window for the first time here. Um, seeing if there's any other questions that I didn't address. Um, no, I think you've pretty much gotten the, uh, questions been posed in here. Great. Well, you know, um, I want to thank you um, for the opportunity to talk about this. I think it's a, it's a upcoming technology that we're probably all going to hear some more about. Um, it's used a lot in so many different industries, law enforcement and uh, solar, um, wind farms, you name it. Um, so it's definitely something that uh, is, uh, the, the technology is going to get better. It's going to get cheaper. Um, and I really do think for broadcasters, it has some pretty cool applications as I've found out already. So um, if I can help anybody or you know any clients that um, could benefit from it, please reach out to me. Uh, be happy to, to help out and, um, um, you know, good to see you all. Thank, thank you for the opportunity, Bear. Well, thanks, Paul. We certainly appreciate uh, the information and, and the uh, pictures and all. And 
hope that you'll do two things. One, uh, as I asked you before, maybe a little article or something that we can print out and post for folks to see. And then secondly, uh, come on back and show us another project. Show us uh, some of the things you've seen and identified and how it can benefit uh, the guys in the field. Yeah, absolutely. I'm doing a lot of work with um, BSWR protection systems as well. If you go to my website, you can see that kind of uh, kind of stuff too. Um, so um, yeah, and I, I wanted to also put in a quick plug for IEEE Broadcast Technology Society. Um, some of you may be familiar with it. They've got a, a great um, program called the Pulse, which is virtual, of course. And um, if you just Google IEEE BTS, you'll see information about that. Um, they've, they've got some really, really good content there. Um, so I would encourage everybody to take a look at that if you want to learn some, some, uh, some really cool stuff from some movers and shakers in the industry. Um, and we're going to be doing something as well in person at NAB in the fall. So if you happen to be traveling to NAB, um, there's another opportunity for, uh, for some good learning there.